Uh, Jake had filled in last Sunday night, and he preached a lesson on um, placing membership at a congregation. Uh, this one sort of piggybacks up, right? Well, it wasn't last Sunday night. It was two Sunday nights ago, right? But he, he preached it on membership and placing membership. Um, but this one kind of piggybacks off of some of the thoughts of that. And um, the question we're going to talk about in the topic is what to do at a congregation in the absence of elders. Uh, so as, as the New Testament defines it, and we keep talking about how we want to be the church of the Bible. We want to do things the way they did, speak the way they speak. Heaven would desire that each congregation follow the biblical pattern of leadership laid out in Scripture. Uh, Jesus is the head of the church universal. There's only one head over the church of Christ, and that's Christ himself. Uh, at the local level, a group of shepherds, notice I said a group of shepherds or pastors oversee the operation of the local church in every city, every place, also known as elders or bishops. Uh, so all these names I'll put up here refer to the same office in Scripture. Uh, sometimes people confuse them, but elders, bishops, pastors, and shepherds are all the same thing. A lot of times I'll be studying with people. They say, oh, you're, oh, you're a pastor over at the church. And I later explain to them how I'm not a pastor. I'm a, a minister or evangelist or preacher at this time. Uh, maybe someday I would like to make it my goal to be one of the elders at this congregation. But um, the, the position of the eldership is what I want to talk about tonight. What do you do if you can't put an eldership in? But this is a local leadership, not a global leadership. Uh, meaning it's just at the local congregation. It's not worldwide over several congregations. So as Jake mentioned recently, uh, this means the elders in one city are only shepherds in that location. Uh, that's the uh, autonomous idea. Jesus is the head. There's, an el there's elders at the local group. They cannot be elders at two different locations at the same time. Just one body of, of the local group. First Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1 say that if a man desires this position, of, of this local leadership position of a, sh of a shepherd or a bishop, he desires a very good work. It's a very good thing to want to be a, a, sh a shepherd over the congregation. If a man desires this position, he must meet 18 qualifications listed in Scripture, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, Titus chapter 1, before he can step into this leadership role. The Bible says he must be the husband of one faithful wife, having faithful children, not a novice, meaning not a brand new Christian, blameless, temperate, meaning sober-minded and self-controlled, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, able to teach, willing to teach, uh, not given to wine, not violent or quarrelsome, not greedy for money or covetous, which is a very important one if you're dealing with money in the church, holy, gentle, having a good testimony among those outside the church, good reputation, uh, not self-willed or selfish, uh, lo a lover of what is good, just, and holding fast the faithful word. Uh, so a man who steps into the position of a shepherd is truly uh, an exemplary model for the flock to follow as a Christian. This is supposed to be a good example person. He is able, uh, he's a man and a group of men who are able to lead the local flock, able to fend off false doctrine. The Bible talks about the eldership being able to do that. He's a man who uh, labors for the flock in love, not by compulsion, but willingly. Uh, and he helps build the congregation where he labors. By the way, as we mentioned earlier, uh, you never see in Scripture any congregation who had only one elder. That was the uh, prescription for disaster. If you want to just put uh, one man in charge, he's calling all the shots. That ain't a good thing. Uh, anytime a pastor oversaw a congregation, it was always with another qualified pastor or elder or a group of qualified uh, elders governing along with him with Christ as the head. So yes, if only one man is qualified to be an elder, there can be no eldership at that congregation. Uh, so you, you might also mention, uh, Scripture mentions the work of the deacons, uh, which is also a good work, who have qualifications listed as well. If you want to be a deacon in the Lord's church, uh, the word deacon means a servant, which is telling of the position of a deacon. It means a, a, a servant to the congregation. Uh, so the deacons serve the congregation. They do not have the same authority as the elders, but they work under the elders um, where they are set in place. 
So this way, uh, the elders can administer and facilitate work to the deacons and other members, and things can run efficiently and smoothly. So, uh, you know, th this is how the Lord set it up. Uh, this is how the Holy Spirit uh, guided uh, the apostles into all truth. The apostleship wasn't going to last forever, uh, but this is what would continue. Jesus as the head, elders over the local flock, and deacons uh, under them. And so... So the elders, they're called the local shepherds. Jesus Christ is called the chief shepherd, 1 Peter chapter 5, and verse 4. The congregation must not put in an eldership unless at least two meet the qualifications. Uh, and by the way, don't get lenient on the qualifications for the elders. Take those seriously. If a man is not qualified, uh, if someone's got something against him for one of those qualifications, don't just stick them in there and say, well, 17 out of 18 is pretty good. Uh, those qualifications are there for a reason. Uh, we need to take them as, as a serious thing. So then the question tonight is, well, okay, so scripturally, what do, is a congregation to do in the absence of, if there's not two or more qualified men who can step into the eldership position? What if no one's qualified yet? Uh, I've heard some, some in the past provide a very unbiblical argument saying that if a group doesn't have an eldership, then they don't have heaven's authority to even exist as a congregation. Uh, and as we'll discuss throughout this lesson, uh, we'll find that this is not even remotely true uh, in accordance with Scripture. But uh, are, are there any Scriptures that shed light on what we're supposed to do in the absence of an eldership? So that's what I'd like to study tonight. Uh, since the formation of uh, this congregation at Davison of the Church of Christ back in the 80s before I was born, uh, our group here has yet to establish an eldership of men who meet the qualifications in Scripture. And we've yet to have two men at the same time who meet the qualifications. Therefore, we've never had one, an eldership. Uh, we're continually working towards, we're building towards uh, having multiple qualified men. That's our goal. Uh, but right now, we're not there yet. Uh, and as I said before, if there's not two men qualified, you cannot establish an eldership with just one qualified man. So uh, as we attend to the business of the church, you know, we always have what we call, um, you know, the men's business meetings. Or, we'll, uh, you know, with the absence of, of elders to make decisions about the various things re regarding the, this congregation, just this group. And truly, someone might ask an honest question, where is the authority for this setup in Scripture? Uh, do we have authority uh, for, quote, men's business meetings when we're told to have an eldership? Uh, would it be wrong, someone might ask, if instead of having the men's meetings, if we just had a congregational meeting, or instead of just the men voting, what if the men and the women were to vote? Is there any guidance on this subject uh, with help? for how we're to set this up when we don't have elders. What are we supposed to do? Some would say there's just nothing said in Scripture. Um, I think there are some things shed, some, some light shed in this area, uh, which is what we're going to study tonight, though. So why men's business meeting? Uh, we'll study tonight that, yes, I believe Scripture gives us enough information so that we can do things the way God would want uh, as we are looking forward to a future eldership. Uh, so first, very briefly, I just want to, I would like to notice scripturally that, you know, I mentioned this before, but a congregation in transition, okay, if you want to call it that by that, I mean a congregation working towards growing the proper biblical leadership of the elders, a congregation in transition, a growing congregation, does have God's approval to be in existence. Uh, my go-to passage for this truth is Titus chapter 1 and verse 5. Paul wrote this to Titus, and he said, Titus for this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders at every city as I commanded you. Now, so consider the island of Crete. I have it up here. It's a little island. It's in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, and I've actually put uh, Michigan up on the screen just as a size comparison for how big uh, Crete is in the Mediterranean. Of course, Michigan and Crete are nowhere near each other uh, on the map, but this is a size comparison. Uh, so as you can see, there it's a pretty big island in the Mediterranean Sea that we're reading about. 
there are several cities that were on the island of Crete. So it wasn't just a, a one congregation sized city. I counted on this particular map that there was uh, 25 uh, cities on this island. So Paul said, uh, Titus, I left you on the island. And your job was to go around to the existing congregations and appoint elders at those congregations. Help those groups at each city appoint qualified men. So, question. I think this is a good question. I zoomed up on Crete. Where, where did these existing congregations come from? Have they always been there? Absolutely not. Uh, did they have elders at the time that Titus was sent? No. Well, first off, where did they come from? Uh, someone, obviously, among the early Christians, likely Paul or one of the other apostles or prophets, had visited the island of Crete, preached the gospel there. At one point, there had been no Christians on the island of Crete, correct? The word had spread and started spreading throughout the ancient world. No Christians on the island of Crete at one point, but as the gospel spread into all the world, there eventually were congregations, Christians, at the local group, planted on, even on the island of Crete in the Mediterranean Sea. And from the letter to Titus, we learn that by the time Paul sends Titus later on, there were multiple congregations already in existence. You go throughout the book of Acts and you see Paul enter a new, uh, all these new cities. And they had never heard the gospel either. And take, for example, Philippi. I'll use Philippi as an example from Acts chapter 16 when Paul traveled there for the first time. It's really neat to see the origin of some of these letters that you get to see in our Bible and the origin of their group. So there's a letter of Philippians. This is their origin, Acts chapter 16. So we see in Acts chapter 16 some of the first converts who made up the members of this particular congregation uh, of, of Philippi. There was Lydia in her household, Acts 16 verse 15. And there was also the Philippian jailer in his household, Acts 16.34. Uh, wouldn't it have been neat to be at the first Sunday service that they had as a congregation at Philippi? First, congreg first meeting that they ever had. Uh, scripture doesn't record this meeting, but they start, as all the rest of the churches, they started meeting on the first day of the week after they were established. So, you know, I'm sure Paul, Paul told them where they were to meet on Sunday. Maybe they picked one of the two families' households uh, and, and met under their roof if it was large enough. Maybe they designated some school building or some this or that, and they said, we're going to meet here on Sunday. And Paul is there, and, and walking up to the meeting house comes the Philippian jailer and his household to the first meeting at Philippi on Sunday. And walking behind them is Lydia and her household. And they're the two families that start, that start of this congregation walking in. And Paul was there to greet them, perhaps. So here you have this new congregation that had been planted, brand new Christians, and two families that we know of made up this uh, small group. So here's another good question. On the first Sunday that Paul met at Philippi, were there elders who oversaw this brand new group of Christians? Uh, yes or no? Someone says, well, I mean, maybe the maybe we don't read about it, but maybe the Philippian jailer uh, could have been one of the elders. Or maybe Lydia's husband was the other one. Travis, you, you don't know that they didn't have elders on the first Sunday that they ever met. But you know what? I do know that they didn't have elders the first Sunday that they met. How do you know? Well, because according to the elder qualifications we just looked at, one of the qualifications that the men must meet is not to be a novice. All right? Well, what's that mean? It means you can't be an elder if you just started being a Christian. And so if they just became a Christian that week and Sunday rolls around, are they allowed to be a shepherd over the flock being a novice? No, they're not. Therefore, there were no elders. Uh, so at places like Philippi and Ephesus and Corinth, a congregation was planted and existed at that location for a while without elders, right? And then they got elders as they grew and matured. For example, Philippians 1 verse 1 shows us that by the time Paul writes the letter to Philippi, that he had established that congregation, he writes them a letter later on. They had qualified elders at this point. Paul and Timothy, bondservant of Jesus Christ, to all the saints of Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons. 
bishop being one of the names for an elder. So Philippi started out without elders. But, even eventually, but then eventually they got elders as they matured as a congregation. An eldership, by the way, is a sign of an older congregation, uh, not a brand new, brand new planted congregation because of uh, the qualifications that need to be met. So thus it was at the island of Crete. Paul or some other group uh, or some other gospel preacher had been to multiple cities on the island of Crete preaching the gospel, baptizing souls, they obeyed the gospel, and then all of a sudden, all these cities, there are different small congregations who start growing and growing over time. Some time goes by. Evidently, enough time goes by for Christian men in those cities to stop being considered novices by the time Paul writes and sends Tim, or Titus. And they are later qualified to step into the eldership position. So Paul sends Titus for this reason. He says, for the cities of Crete, it's time. He said, enough time has gone by for those congregations to get their men up to par to where they should have men qualified to step into this position. Because by this time, there should be qualified men. I I want you to go around the cities of Crete to the existing congregations and, and from their pool of men, designate men who actually meet all 18 of these qualifications. Set up elders, plural, elders in every city. So uh, is it scriptural for a time not to have an eldership as you are trying to grow an eldership and nurture godly men who will later become elders? Do we have the right to exist? Yes. Right? That's, that's the only way it can work. Um, so now here's our question tonight. Let's say Paul leaves one of these cities, the church of Philippi. We'll take that for example. He just planted the church. He was there for, I don't know how long he was at Philippi. Maybe it, was, maybe it says, I know at Corinth, he stayed a year and a half. At Philippi, let's say Paul leaves. Leaves this young congregation with no eldership to be Christians at Philippi. Just like Christians at Davison are fending for themselves being Christians in Davison. And so let's say the church of Philippi takes one of their young men uh, who has been firmly grounded in the truth and makes him their preacher. Said, well, you're going to be our preacher uh, here at this congregation. And as 1 Corinthians chapter 9 talks about, let's say this young preacher at Philippi is going to be paid from the church treasury of the Christians who donate every Sunday to the Lord's collection. My question is, who in the congregation makes the decision on how to pay the preacher, for example? Right? In the absence of elders, who decides that? Someone's got to make that decision if you're going to pay the preacher. Let's say the church at Philippi, again, no elders early on, start growing so fast that they will no longer fit inside Lydia's household. Let's say that's where they were meeting. They started with 15 Christians, let's say, and after Paul left, they started growing, and they got to be a group of 50 Christians. And imagine it is Lydia's house that they were meeting at, and she can't fit them anymore. So they decide to use the money that's been being raised for a meeting house that they can build and, and more people can fit inside a, a, you know, a church building, I guess you call it. So right, business-related activity, using the treasury, uh, starts taking place uh, at Philippi, for example, without elders. So who's making the decisions for all these things in the absence of the elders? Uh, and here's the thought tonight. Did you know that in the absence of elders, there is a default system of authority uh, set up elsewhere, spoken of elsewhere in, uh, for the church, before elders are set in place as the governing authority? Well, let's ask some questions. Is it the preacher who makes all the decisions? No, not the preacher. Uh, is it a congregational vote? No. Uh, Is it a board of directors or a finance committee within the church? No. Uh, What other authority uh, exists among Christians before elders are are ordained with their proper qualifications? Uh, So this is where I wish to explain why we appoint the men of the congregation to decide these things uh, and not both the men and the women. 
And here's why we do it this way. So here is why we have just men's business meetings and not a, a conjoined men and women's business meeting. So I have six points uh, to cover for the second half of this lesson that helps us to determine this question. How do we know what to do? Well, here are some guiding principles. Uh, number one in the church. Uh, this is 1 Corinthians 11, verse 2. It's where I'd like to start. It says that the man is head over the woman. And before you know, people, if, if you're visiting, don't throw a tomato at me. But here's what it says. It says the man is head over the woman as the designation of leadership. Okay, uh, so here's the verse. It says, Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. All right, don't change things that we've been talking about. Do, do things, set things up the same way in the same teachings. What's he say? But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of woman is man and the head of Christ is God. So notice each one's head. The head of man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. So that's sort of the order you see here. And by the way, I always point out here that the man's headship, quote, over the woman is not derogatory toward the women. It's not disrespectful towards the women. In the same way that God the Father's headship over Christ is not derogatory nor disrespectful to Christ, them being equal to each other. What headship means is I submit myself to the authority of someone else's wishes and what they want me to do. I willingly do what they ask. And in the case of Jesus submitting himself beneath the, beneath the leadership of God the Father, you have two equals, two individuals who are equal to each other, and one is submitting himself beneath, beneath the will and the wishes of the other. And so the idea is God the Father in this scenario is calling the shots with regards to the plan of redemption, came from the mind of the Father, with regards to the creation of the world, was commanded by God the Father, and Jesus went and performed it. So the God the Father said, let's do this. And Jesus said, I'll do whatever you want me to do. So you see, that's what headship means. It's, it's a line of authority. Uh, it's a... You know, I could throw in here that we're told to obey the laws of the land. We're told to honor the king, obey the king, as long as he's not disobeying God. Uh, you, me, and the president, we're all equal in the eyes of God, aren't we? But we're to do what he tells us to do. Uh, he, he is not superior to us in the way God sees each soul. His soul is no more valuable than ours. But we're told, obey the king, honor the king. And so it's not derogatory. Uh, it's not degrading to have a line of authority. Uh, we always use this illustration. Uh, you like to use this Old Testament illustration of the Levites in the Old Testament who were given religious authority over all the other 11 tribes. So if you were from the tribe of Levi in the Old Testament, God gave you authority. You did the tabernacle work. You had to be a Levite. You had God's permission uh, to perform the sacrifices. But to the other 11 tribes who were probably fully capable of doing what the Levites did, but it was assigned to the Levites, the other 11 tribes were not given the same authority. They couldn't do it. So did God love those of the tribe of Levi more than the other tribes? Oh, Levi's up, the tribe of Levi people, they're up here. No, right? He just needed to designate part of the group who would take the lead in the religious aspect of the Old Testament, the house of worship. And that meant the others, who he did not give the lead to, needed to submit themselves to the lead of the Levites. That's pretty easy to understand. All 12 tribes, if you're faithful, you'll go to heaven, you'll be the same status in heaven. You might get more honor if you were in a position of leadership and did it well, but all people are equal in that sense. The other example I used from the Old Testament uh, was David in the Old Testament. And when he was the one who came up with this idea of building the great temple. But God said, no, since you are a man of war, I do like the idea of the temple, but I'm going to have your son Solomon build it instead of you. And you will allow Solomon 
to take the lead over this project, he's in charge, you're not. Therefore, what did David willingly do as a man after God's own heart? Submitting to the lead of God, but God told him, you need to submit to the lead of who? Solomon. And so he put himself beneath someone who was equal to him and said, well, if God wants me to let Solomon run the show, Solomon's running the show. And I love the heart and the attitude of David who said, I'm not allowed to go to the building ground and, and touch my hammer or anything or build anything, but here's what I'll do. I'm going to ask the Lord permission. Can I help get supplies for the temple? And he said, I'm going to do every single bit of work that I possibly can do within my realm of authority. And that was his attitude. But he did not uh, supersede the authority of Solomon that was given over him. So it worked that way with Christ submitting to the, uh, the lead of God the Father. It worked that way with Israel submitting to the lead of the Levites. It worked that way with David submitting himself to the leadership of Solomon. Right? Not derogatory, not disrespectful, just a line of authority, just like the laws of the land and the, the, those in charge of the land that we ourselves are all to submit to. And this is the concept. Exactly what has been asked of women in the Lord's church, that they submit to the leadership of the men in the church. Right? The head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. 1 Corinthians 11. I think as we keep going here, I think when people get offended about this topic, they don't get it. They don't truly understand the topic. Um, but number two, this is exactly the line of authority that God set in the home as well. And this is not derogatory either. Ephesians 5 verse 23 says, The husband is head over the wife. Uh, what's this mean? The husband has the assignment in every home that exists on the face of this earth. The husband is assigned by God, lead the home. You lead the home. The wife is told to follow the lead of the husband. God set it up this way. God told us to learn this. Uh, Ephesians 5 verse 24 says, Therefore, in the same way that Christ is sub or that the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. The idea is, husbands, your, your assignment is to lead the wife. Be a leader. Be the leader in the home. Treat her well. Uh, love her so much you lay down your life for her. Provide for her. Do what's best for her and the children. And wives, let your husband lead. Right? Submit to the leadership that he has, but he's not as good of a leader as me. God, that's like someone in the Old Testament saying, I'm not a Levite. I can do the tabernacle work better than the Levites can. I don't care. You're not a Levite. Therefore, submit to whatever God told us to do. Sometimes people will say, well, it's just because you're a man that you preach this stuff. But if I, was, if I was a woman, I know my mom, she can't get up here and speak because of this, but she agrees, my wife agrees, this is what God told us to do. We're just trying to submit to exactly what he told us to do with leadership. So the idea is exactly what we've been, what we've been saying. So um, we talked about this quite a bit. As God gave these two assignments, one to the husband, the other to the wife, some are surprised when they actually obey God how well this works as God's assignment. Imagine that. God knows how this is going to work. Uh, are women sometimes, many times, better leaders than men? Yeah. But when you just submit to what God told you to do, say, well, if God's telling him to lead me, then I'm going to back off. I'm going to let him lead. So when the husband loves his wife, though, the way God told him to, when the husband treats her the way God told him to, and, and when he leads the way God told him to, and then the wife does her assignment, and doesn't try to go against his every wish, man, it works marvelously. It's such a harmonious relationship. And the world tries to taint it as it's something domineering and it's so ugly that you're you know, against women. But you know, she is willing to walk with her husband. And whatever decision he makes, whatever path he chooses, so long as it's not sinful, man, God's plan for the home works better than anything man is trying to do out there.
Correct? Uh, do you want a happy home? Follow that setup. Husbands, don't lead in a domineering, cruel, holier-than-thou, better-than-thou sort of way. Uh, that's not the way Christ treats the church. That's not the way God the Father treated Jesus as he was head over him. And then wives, as you submit to your husband, don't complain at his every move. If we, if we do this right, the way the Bible says, it works out very well. And it makes for the happiest home possible. Yes, uh, even at the beginning, this was the assignment God gave to Eve and to all the wives as part of her curse in the woman, uh, woman's curse. You know, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16, To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow in your conception, and in pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. All right, so God said, I give the leadership to your husband, and my commandment is that you submit to his lead. And this is what was taught in the New Testament as well. Uh, now number three, uh, even without talking about the males being assigned the eldership yet, we're not going to talk about that yet, we learn that this system of authority also carries out throughout the whole church. This is the same type of system that works in the functioning and in the systems as how, how the church operates. Man as head over uh, the woman. And so this was our assignment from heaven. Uh, number three, from 1 Timothy chapter 2, and verse 8, the men of the congregation are commanded to lead the prayers at the church assembly. If I wanted to you know, invite women to, to, to lead prayers, because you know, that's not the way I feel, I don't have the authority to make that call. This is Jesus' church. This isn't Travis's church. So here God asks men to do the prayer leading and specifies not the women in this later context. The verse says, I desire, therefore, that the men pray in every place. They do the praying everywhere. So it's the idea. If you get together on a, on a Sunday night for worship, that's what we're doing right now, I want the men to lead the prayers. He specified. Uh, if you get together in, in any place, every place, on a Friday night Bible study, I want the men to lead the prayers in every place. In every place where Christian men and women take part in prayer, I want the men to lead that prayer. Number four, from the same chapter, where um, you know, the men are also the ones commanded to do the preaching and the teaching in the assembly. Um, for, uh, First Timothy chapter 2 and verse 11 says, with regards to your assembling together, let a woman learn in silence with all submission. And I do not permit, I do not allow a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. Remember the context though is in the church, in the church gatherings. So when the church starts doing church things, if you want to put it that way, when we assemble for worship, when we come together as one group for something, based on this command of authority that God has set up, he says these two things first and foremost. I want the men to lead the prayers, and I want the men to do the teaching in the midst of the church, and that the women take the back seat and let them, let them do this. Okay, I've assigned the men. And notice that he says specifically, I do not permit the woman to get up in front and to teach. Again, not derogatory, not disrespectful. David could have felt, oh, God just thinks I'm lesser than Solomon because he doesn't let me build the temple. But that wasn't David's attitude. He said, well, I'm just going to do whatever God wants me to do. Solomon's going to take the lead on this project. Uh, so it's not allowed in the Church of Christ. Uh, and that was what the Church of the Bible reads like. That was heaven's authority. Uh, of course, though, we see elsewhere that she, meaning a woman in the church, can teach a man if he's lost. If there's a man outside and she needs to evangelize teaching the gospel, she can teach him. She can also teach in the church the children and, and help guide up. And she can teach the women. So like the heart of David who said, I'll do whatever I can do within my realm of authority. That's what godly women are doing in the church. And maybe God knew better than us because if you told me to go teach baby Eli back there and all the young kids, I don't think I'd do as well as my mom or Betty or Lorraine, Kristen. And so God knows. And he has reasons for setting it up this way. But um, here God says through Paul's pen, 
as the men have been assigned the duty of, of leading the church assemblies, right? The leadership, the headship. I want the women to take part in the, in the public group in quietness, in silence. I don't want them taking on anything in the assembly that pertains to taking the lead. The lead has been assigned for the men, so the prayers, the preaching, and that's, that's the, for the men to do in the church. And with regards to the church meetings, quote, I do not permit a woman to have authority over a man but to be in silence. And that's point number five. Okay, the one, oh, point number five. Uh, the women are commanded not to have authority over the men of the church. And again, this is particularly the church. Um, if, if a woman was ever the president or if a woman was the queen over the land, that's not talking that we shouldn't submit to the leader, the king, and the queen, right? Um, this is in the church, this context. Now, it doesn't mean if you have a boss uh, out in the secular world and she's a woman that you shouldn't do what she tells you to do. Right? This is in the church, the context of the church. So uh, I want to read from an article written by Brother Wayne Jackson on this topic. Um, he said with reference to 1 Timothy 2, verse 12, here is an apostolic prohibition against a woman exercising authority over a man. And I would insert there in the church. Uh, Paul writes, but I do not permit, I permit not a woman to teach nor to have dominion over a man, but to be in quietness, 1 Timothy 2 and verse 12. The Greek phrase rendered to have dominion over, ASV, simply means to exercise authority, to have authority uh, over another. Denker notes that practically speaking, it signifies to tell a man what to do. Uh, the apostle forbids the woman to occupy a role in which she wields authority over the man. The Christian woman is thus not permitted to function in a capacity in which she makes church decisions that a man is expected to make. So uh, with these two major passages that we just studied, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and 1 Timothy chapter 2, I think we're starting to understand this practice of, in the absence of elders, looking to the men of the church as this is the default system of authority that we see elsewhere, right? It's based off of this basic principle of leadership for the functioning of the church and its gatherings and how the church operates. So next, number six, now consider again how the full and proper leadership is finally set up. God assigned the men specifically of the congregation to step in and be the elders once they get to that point and to be the deacons. So the ideal leadership is the elders and the deacons. They have to be men. Um, therefore, from all, all these statements in Scripture, we conclude that if there is a leadership assignment in any congregation in the absence of elders, God desires that the man take the lead uh, and the women do not. All right, so this is why when having questions about uh, the church treasury and where we're to send the money uh, of the congregation or discussing how much to pay the visiting preacher or who's going to be in charge of this work or that work, we default to the men of the congregation in the absence of the elders for these reasons. Uh, so because notice when the principle or sorry, when the Bible discusses the leading of the prayers and, and the leading of the public teaching, God doesn't say, let it be an elder of the church. You know, imagine if that was a setup. He said, if anyone's going to say a prayer, it's got to be an elder. If anyone gets up and preach, it has to be an elder. But that's not what he said. Uh, it certainly may be an elder. An elder can get up and say a prayer or, or preach a lesson. But the assignment was very simple without even putting elders into the equation. He said, if anyone gets up to lead something, let it be a man. Let it be a Christian man. But I do not permit a woman to get up and speak in the assembly. Uh, another powerful passage that reiterates the same concept uh, and sheds the light on the decision to make the men's business meetings uh, is 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 34 to 35. Uh, in that context, Paul talks about the operation of the first century church uh, as, they, as pertains to spiritual gifts in the Lord's church. And he made a statement about these those who were speaking in tongues in the first century in the gatherings, and they didn't have an interpreter. He said, hey, in verse 28, if there's no interpreter, zip it. I do not permit him to speak, but if there's no interpreter to s interpret the tongue that he's speaking in, I don't want him to make a sound in the, in the church. But then notice in this context, he says the same thing about the women of the, of the congregation. 
Uh, he says in 1 Corinthians 14, 34, and 35, Let your women keep silent in the churches, uh, for they are not allowed, permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, which that's typically what, what happens most of the time. A men's, I mean, some of the things in the men's meeting are supposed to be confidential, and they are. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk about things, and we'll, I'm, I'm sure the, the women are getting some input in those meetings because they talk to their husbands, and they say, well, my vote's going to be skewed a little because my wife said this and put this little voice in my ear, so I'm taking her into account. And that's the idea, right? The leadership of the man, though, uh, can listen to the you can we can listen to the voice of a woman, but it's not to have authority over the man's decision. Um, and so he says, when the whole church comes together, uh, it's not God's will that a woman would get up and say anything before the whole group. Why? Because she is commanded by God to submit to the leadership of the men of the group. Um, by the way, this whole sermon is not very politically correct nowadays, is it? Right? Uh, and I commend this group here for even uh, for putting up with the truth because there's a lot of groups who wouldn't let this be even spoken of, but this is exactly what the New Testament says, and we're just trying to follow it. Um, but listen, we're, we're, all, we're trying to follow God's pattern for the church as it was written from the very start. We just want to obey God. Uh, we know that none of this stuff was supposed to change. Remember Paul's statement that he made uh, in 1 Corinthians 11. He said specifically, he said, Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things, in this part. Keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. Right? You remembered when I was, was with you and God was showing us as the apostles how to set things up. You remember what I taught you. And how we set things up. And, and when we gathered together on the first day of the week, the things that we did and how we did them. Uh, what was the next thing he wrote? He said, but I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. So he specified here, hey, listen, as time goes on, remember that this system of, of authority is not meant to change as time goes on. Uh, people are going to want to change it, but you keep the original setup. Don't depart from these commands. Uh, you do things just exactly as we showed you. All right, so as we close, I just want to talk about two more, if you want to call them unacceptable options uh, for business and leadership decisions of the church in the absence of elders. So here are some two more things I think are, are, are not right. So we've already discussed how through the, uh, these principles in the absence of elders, the authority decisions simply default to the men, the men of the congregation, and the women lead, they, they follow the lead of the men. So that's the reason for the men's meetings. Uh, that's the reason the men will get together and they'll discuss the things and the women are not included in the decision making. But very quickly, what are some other setups out there uh, that some have tried and why are these things not a good idea and perhaps not even, and certainly not even scriptural at all? Uh, so here's these two things. Uh, you've heard of some churches assigning, I mentioned this earlier, board of directors or a finance committee. Um, and yes, usually this leadership panel uh, will have men and women on it in a lot of churches. That, oh, we're, we're, the, we're the board, we're the committee, where we make the decisions. Uh, and that's not correct because based on everything we've just been talking about uh, with the men and the women. But what's also wrong is that if the congregation votes and they try to pick the six smartest um, men, you say that we, we pick the, the smartest men to, to lead the group in these decisions, essentially what you have is the forming of an eldership without the qualifications, right? We say it's, it's, you know, this meeting's not for all the men, but it's just for the, the four smartest men at this congregation. We're the board. And you set up this leadership position that's not even in Scripture, so that's what we have to be careful of. So the problem is, in order to have sole authority over, the, over business decisions in that fashion, you have to be a qualified elder. Um, so assigning only a few men, they call all the shots, and they make all the decisions isn't good because they're not qualified to have authority over the rest of the men. They have no authority over the rest of the men. Secondly, this is what you see in the other churches have. Um, instead of a small group calling the shots, a lot of times they'll have one man calling the shots. 
right? I titled this one, uh, One Man Who Tries to Be the Pastor Even Though He's Not a Pastor at All. Right? So you've got the one man pastoral system that many use today. But number one, most of the time when we're talking about this situation, he's not even qualified to be a biblical pastor. A lot of, you know, in the Catholic Church or something, they're not even married. Uh, a lot of them don't have children. Uh, but then number two, the New Testament doesn't even permit one sole elder. There's always supposed to be a plurality of elders. So it's, it seems that this is what was happening with a man referenced in 3 John 1 verse 9 na named Diotrephes, if you remember him, who seemed to be taking it upon himself in uh, where, whatever city he was in to be the sole leader and he loved to call all the shots right uh, third john chapter 1 verse 9 says i wrote to the church but diotrephes who loves to have the preeminence among them that means he loves being in charge uh, he loves being seen as the leader even though he wasn't a true elder he said i, I wrote you a letter but Basically, this Diotrephes intercepted it and wouldn't allow them to receive John's letter. He said, he, did not, he does not receive us. Therefore, if I come to you, I will call to mind his deeds which he does, pratting against us with malicious words, and not content with that, he himself does not receive the brethren and forbids those who wish to, putting them out of the church. So he's pushing people out of the church. He's saying, no, you're, you're, out, you're out of here. I'm calling the shots. So even back then, you'd have certain individuals who would raise themselves up on a pedestal and they would try to lord over the whole group. And the idea is all these different setups are wrong. So uh, we need elders governing the flock. And if no two men are qualified, then the men of the church lead collectively. So hopefully this uh, discussion sheds some light on what a congregation is supposed to do if they don't have qualified elders. And that is the case uh, here at Davison at the moment. Uh, so that's our lesson for tonight, why we do things the way we do. Um, so if you have any need, uh, the invitation is about to be offered at the singing of the song. If you're not a Christian, the Bible says you need to become a Christian by hearing that gospel, believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who came down to die on the cross, repent of sins, confess Him before men, and be baptized in water for the forgiveness of sins. Coming up out of the water, you're now a member of the Lord's church. And we just have to be faithful until, to the new covenant until the day we die. Um, so if anybody needs to do that tonight, the water's ready. And if any Christians have any uh, need of repentance or any confession of sins, uh, we ask that you have a seat on the front row as we stand and sing.